But good morning, everyone. Welcome. We're going to go ahead and get started. For those of you who don't know me, and I see lots of faces in the room that I don't. Okay, I'm ignoring the man to my right. Uh, I'm Kelly McGurdy with Puget Sound Regional Council. This is Mark Daly from Thurston Regional Planning Council. He's also going to give some introductory remarks. And then we're going to launch in, but the most important business of the day, coffee, pastries, and the restrooms, you're going to have to go out that door all the way down to the hallway. Um, there is going to be some random intermittent noise in front. The students are going to be doing a show later, so they've kind of got us blocked off. So remember, restrooms go out that door. Welcome. Thank you. So um, I just want to quickly introduce this. You know, we are here, we're all here because we all recognize the importance of project delivery, and we understand that there's a lot of challenges with implementing projects, but those challenges are magnified when you add federal funds to the mix. And so really, today we wanted to bring some folks together to talk about some of those challenges and, and help folks um, understand what some of the pitfalls are and get, a front, get in front of them and be as successful as possible. Um, one of the things I always tell my folks is we, that it is really critical that we make the most effective use of our federal dollars and we deliver those funds every year because we want to make sure we are not losing any of those dollars, either in state or out of state, and we want to position ourselves to receive even more dollars. So recognizing those challenges, um, again, we this, this summit today, this is for you, so feel free to ask questions. Ryan and I are going to be roaming, uh, roaming the room with the microphone so you can ask your questions. We have our state and federal partners here today to talk about the requirements, talk about some of the common challenges and pitfalls. You're going to hear from a few of your peer agencies, and they're going to share their lessons learned. But again, um, today is for you, so hopefully we'll have a, a great meeting. Um, one message for our webinar participants before I turn it over to Mark for him to add his comments. There are a lot of you. I think we had about 70 um, remote locations registered, and we know some of those locations are going to have a lot of people. So you are in listen-only mode. Um, we're not going to be able to be interactive with the chat feature, but we are recording this. We're going to post it to our website later. I've got my team that's going to take lots of notes, so we're going to post um, uh, questions and answers later. But if you do have, for those of you on the webinar, if you do have questions, Feel free to write them in your chat or send us an email. We will collect them and we'll respond to you later and we'll get all of that information out, uh, out to each of you. And I think that was all I had. So thanks again for coming. Apologies for the rain and the parking. Uh, but I'm going to turn it over to Mark so that he can get his remarks as well. Hi, uh, I'm Mark Daly. I'm the director at Thurston Regional Planning Council uh, down near Olympia. Uh, and I just want to thank Kelly and Stephanie and Dave and others for letting us tag along on this. I think this was such a great idea to get everybody together in the same room. We all touch this federal funding at, at, diff at different times in the process and in different ways, and yet it's so critical that we get this right so that we make sure that we use those funds most effectively and that we get the projects done. And so I'm really looking forward to, because from an MPO perspective, we see things um, differently and, and deal with these federal funds in a different way than a lot of you all that are trying to get project and program work implemented. And so it'll be really helpful to, to hear what works well, what doesn't work well, what kind of challenges everyone is having uh, and what kind of opportunities there are to improve how we use these federal funds and deliver this work. So I'm really appreciative of this, and hopefully this might be something we do every so often, because yeah, I know it's going to work really, really well. We've got a lot of people um, from our area on the webinar, so thank you all in Thurston for uh, hopping on as well. Thank you. Just sent fear into Monica's heart that we're going to do this on a regular basis. Um, so with that, without further ado, let's launch in. And I want to um, again thanks uh, to Stephanie Tax and Dave Kaiser from Washdot for being here. I know I don't know if Rick Rick just got here, so he's later on the agenda. Thank you, Rick Judd from Federal Highway Administration. So Stephanie and Dave and Monica, if you would come help us load up the slides. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Stephanie Tax. I'm the program manager. For local programs up in or down in Olympia. I've been on the east side earlier this week, so I'm trying to get my bearings. So welcome. We put together the various requirements per phase, 
documentation for each phase for when you submit your packages for fund authorization, as well as some of the obstacles we see in being able to authorize your projects. Dave Kaiser of my team is usually the first one that sees your package after I get it and goes through it and tells me whether I can sign on the dotted line or the straight line. So he's gonna go through most of this presentation and, sorry, things are crazy. But um, I'm also the one that's working on the 976 stuff for the local agency part. So when you saw that letter that came out, that was, that list was very interesting to put together these last few weeks. So we can take questions at the end as Dave goes through the various phases of documentation and pitfalls, please ask questions. That's why we're here. We, we have Federal Highways, Rick Judd and his team, Caitlin, Tanya's here, and I think um, Matt, I thought I saw him. Yeah. So Matt Kunick on the planning side. So this is your training. We're just trying to, everything that we're going through is in the lag manual, the local agency guidelines manual. So we tried to put all the references in the training package so that when you're back at your office, you can kind of go through and go, oh, that's right. So you have that reference. And so with that, I'm gonna let Dave get started and welcome. Hi, I'm Dave Kaiser. I work with Stephanie uh, in the program management section of local programs. Um, like Stephanie said, we're, we do the processing of all the federal and state local projects. Um, so we'll, we'll be the ones that are reviewing the agreements um, and all the other documentation. So we're gonna, I'm going to talk about the four different phases that we uh, can authorize on projects. Um, the first is the planning phase. So the planning phase is... Okay, so uh, the planning phase. So the plan, planning phases are uh, non-construction projects. It is work elements that it will, um, we're not going to be doing any uh, construction on. Um, these are standalone separate projects. So if we have a planning project, it will have a single agreement. If anything, if we advance to an actual construction project, your construction project, design right away construction, uh, will be a separate agreement, separate off the authorizations. So uh, these are studies. So we can have like a corridor study or maybe studying an intersection, trying to find out if, uh, you know, what needs to be done there. Uh, public education and outreach. These are typically uh, CTR uh, type projects or training for safe routes to school. Um, these types of projects uh, must uh, be set up to cover a specific time frame. So these can't be perpetual projects that we just carry over. They need to be set up for um, maybe a calendar year, a biennium, a fiscal year, but they need to have a specific time frame attached to them. And then other types of planning activities uh, like a UPWP, the Unified Planning Work Programs that the MPOs uh, have, or STP administration projects. So as for a planning phase, uh, the documentation, if we're authorizing a planning phase, the documentation that we're going to need uh, for a federal project is it has to be in the step. All federal projects must be in the step. Um, then there's the uh, prospectus, the planning prospectus. Uh, it, that's in the, in the lag. It just it's a five or six page document that details out what you're doing in your uh, in your planning phase, whether it's a study or um, outreach. The local agency agreement, that's the uh, federal document that allows us to authorize the federal funds. Uh, documented cost estimate. So this is a document that based, uh, details out how you arrived at what you think your project was going to cost. So if we, it, and your estimate has to have sufficient detail to show where the dollar amounts are coming from. 
Uh, it doesn't work to just say, we think this is gonna be $50,000. You have to show us how you got to this $50,000. So whether it's a total number of hours uh, multiplied by a labor cost or something similar, we do need to see that. Um, the completed authorization package checklist. Uh, this is a two page document that um, can be used for every project. Not all of it will be applicable, applicable to every project, but it talks about all of the requirements, all of the documentation that we'll need. Um, so that, that's just a, a helpful document to uh, get everybody uh, through the documentation that we're gonna need for the authorization. And then as far as compliance is concerned uh, for a planning phase, um, we're gonna need to see uh, progress with the project. So we need to know that the project is active and that it's being pursued. And the easiest way for us to see this is when we receive progress uh, reimbursement requests. So that's really important to make sure that we're billing for projects monthly uh, as much as possible. Um, but we need to make sure that the projects are moving so they don't go inactive. Um, final reimbursement request, this is same for every project. We just wanna know what the final project cost is so we can close the project. The final project summary or final report. So when we do a study or um, public outreach, we need a final output and we need to see that. It basically acts as a final, like a final inspection for a construction project. So that'll be, we can get a copy of it. If it's posted on the web, just providing a, a link to that document is perfect. So that's the planning stuff. Anybody have any questions on planning? The building might be present, which makes an agreement. But uh, on the other hand, we've heard from two that you could actually maybe go corporately. I know the Department of Ecology has allowed us to do that, and they actually formally said that we're okay with you going corporately, even though it says monthly in our agreement. I'm wondering if that's something washed out with entertaining moving for Maybe you don't have any expenditures that month. But so we have considered it. The issue we have, which Rick will touch on later, is that for is Federal Highways has an inactive report. And so for local agencies, we are at the twelve million dollar range for all local agency projects of $12 million sitting inactive without a reimbursement request within the nine months. So it's one of those things that we look back on history and we do it on a case by case basis. If that's what you, if that's what you can show us that you can bill us, we're, you know, we'll work with you on that, but it's really about staying off that inactive list. To work with us, see if it's something in writing that we can do. Don't worry about it. Correct. Yeah, we can do that. Okay, but it'll have to be a proposal that's provided to us, and then we can consider it. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, so now on to uh, the preliminary engineering uh, design PE phase. So this is going to be a typical typical type of project that we see. Um, so the documentation for authorization, again, current step document. So it has to be in the current approved step. The project prospectus is a three-page document that briefly gives the scope of work, the term and I, um, estimates for the entire project, um, and then talks about the design elements, right away, whether right away is uh, gonna be necessary or not, those types of things. Vicinity maps and roadway sections. The, 
the vicinity map, what we're asking for is a, a map where we can clearly see the project, the termini, so that we can find it. If, some, if we needed to, we can find it. Um, it's helpful if the view on it's large enough so that we can see a city or some other landmark. A lot of times we get vicinity maps that are so zoomed in that um, there's no way to know whether where it's at. So that's helpful. Roadway sections, so just to show the, the you know the limits, the right of way limits, the uh, lane widths, any type of pedestrian bike facilities, sidewalks. We need to see that. The local agency agreement again. That's our uh, federal authorization our agreement that allows us to seek federal authorization, documented cost estimate, the checklist. So these are, a lot of this is gonna be the same on all projects. Um, as far as compliance is concerned, again, the monthly billing or as frequently as, oh, thank you. Um, monthly billing. Uh, environmental documentation. So if we have a federal project with where we use federal money in the design phase, you are required to uh, follow the environmental documentation or procedures that are detailed in the lag, the local agency guidelines. So this involves uh, getting NEPA uh, approval prior to any federal right-of-way or construction authorization. Um, your environmental commitments that you detail in your design phase have to be incorporated into your future phases. So any right of way construction, um, your once approved, your environmental has to be reevaluated every three years. So if you have a long project, you need to be aware of that. And then, so if we're doing a federal project, once we put federal funds in the PE phase, you're committing to build the project. So that doesn't mean you have to have federal money in your construction phase, but it does mean that you're gonna to have to build the project. So if you don't, there are, and we'll get to the, there's a slide a little bit later that explains this a little bit better, but this one last bullet that's in here is state funds don't have that same requirement so if per chance you've received a state award a state grant and those can do only PE so if we start something with state funds it doesn't have the same federal requirement um, next is we're going to talk about the environment uh, NEPA environmental stuff a little bit more in depth and um, Melanie Vance from our from the environmental program manager for local programs is going to uh, present the next couple of slides. Right, Dave, how do I not mess this up? So just advance with that. Only touch that button. Okay, I can do that. Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, as Dave mentioned, I'm Melanie Vance. I am with the WashDOT Local Programs Office. I am the environmental my staff and I are responsible for guiding your projects through the NEPA process. And I was asked to speak today about pitfalls and challenges in the PE phase of project delivery. And I have a big one for you. So this slide is intentionally alarmist. Um, the question is asking, what transportation projects may require consultation with National Marine, National Marine Fisheries Service, NIMFS, as we call them, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service prior to NEPA approval? And the answer is, this can be any project that is touching surface waters that drain to Puget Sound. And when I say touching, we mean obviously bridge maintenance, alerts, Culvert extensions, culvert replacements, stormwater outfalls, and then another kicker that catches people sometimes, new pavement without stormwater treatment. So if we are chemically touching the water, it still counts. So obviously, if a culvert requires fish passage upgrades, it will also require ESA consultation as well. 
the reason I'm being intentionally alarmist about this is that by looking at the STIP, I don't see where all of these booby traps lie. So for example, I met a couple months ago with a local agency who I don't see here, but I'm not gonna name them. And I'm gonna read what their STIP description says. It says, upgrade existing two lane roadway to three lanes, including bike lanes, curb, gutter, sidewalk, landscape strip, illumination, and associated drainage improvements. Sounds pretty boring, sounds pretty much like what we do all the time, a normal, regular project. Surprise, they had two fish passage culverts in there. Because in order to get their new roadway section in, they had to lengthen the culverts because the culverts weren't long enough. <laughs> And they had a right-of-way phase programmed in June of 2021. And here it is, October of 2019. And I had to tell them, I don't know if I can make that deadline for you. So you're wondering, what is going on here? Well, we're somewhat in hyperdrive right now. We are heading into a new galaxy of environmental regulation and review. We are stuck right now between some internal staffing challenges at National Marine Fishery Service, NIMFS, and some emerging science. So first I'm gonna to touch on the first part of this, workload management. So as many of you know, we experienced a government shutdown about a year ago. And during that time, NIMFS and US Fish and Wildlife Service were involved in that government shutdown. In the meantime, workload from various agencies, including our program, the Navy, ports, marinas, Army Corps, MONPA wanting to put a dock in Lake Union, something, everything in that category, just continued to pile up. Once the government shutdown ended, they were trying to figure out how do we prioritize our workload? And their direction from DC was to not work on overwater structure applications, which is all the agencies I mentioned. We're lumped in with Navy ports. They're not just picking on transportation. It's anything that's dealing with overwater structures. And that has been a direction out of DC. They told us this last spring, they are essentially not going to be picking up any of our workload until sometime during the summer of 2020. You can imagine the backlog that they're going to be sitting on if they have applications going into them and they're not sorting them. So with any, I can't say with any confidence that we're gonna get our projects through their Endangered Species Act review until probably a year later. In addition to that, they're having some staffing challenges. They're, they're having to sit on positions. They're having to use contract employees. And so myself and Federal Highways, we have had to go and meet with some of these folks and try to establish some working relationships with individuals that we have never worked with before. On the other side, of the equation, we have the emerging science. And most of us have seen in the news, the southern resident killer whale is tanking. There's a lot of indication that the reason for that are food chain impacts, read Chinook, among other things, but Chinook is their main prey base. And so we are getting a lot of scrutiny on any projects that impact Chinook or other forage fish in marine waters and most of, our, most of our projects aren't in marine waters, so I'm not going to touch on that. So the last piece of this is that water, for unknown reasons at this point, is getting more toxic to aquatic life. We don't know why, but over the last four to five years, even when the pavement isn't expanded, the stormwater itself is more lethal to salmonids. 
And there's speculation that it could be materials coming off of tires. It could be different brake lining materials, different antifreezes that are being used. We just don't know at this point. But in the past, when we used to be able to say, we're following the highway runoff manual, we're good to go on stormwater, that doesn't necessarily cut it anymore because the highway runoff manual does allow uh, up to, I believe, 4,000 square feet of untreated pollution generating impervious surface. So we do need to take a better look at that because we are getting more scrutiny. So yes, our projects are getting a lot more scrutiny and a lot less staff manage them. And here's the image, the spoiler, it already happened. I was gonna have it actually scream, but you know, I'm not that good with PowerPoint yet. So what can you do? You can be proactive. You can budget adequate time to get through the environmental process. Understand that it could take you two years to get through this process. And some of that is dead time that I can't crunch. There's nothing I can do about it. I have to, I have to wait just along, along with everybody else. And if you've budgeted enough time for this, it won't, won't be a crisis. To be even more proactive, Please get us involved early. I cannot stress this enough. Like I mentioned in my example, we can find these problems early and then figure out ways to manage them in your schedule so that ultimately you can meet your ad date. We are not, um, you know, we, we're, we're, we take our show on the road. Um, I'm seeing some unfamiliar faces, so I'm thinking some of you are more familiar with Jody Beal in our office. We do come out and meet with folks. We do phone conference, NEPA kickoff meetings. Please get a hold of your local programs engineer's office early. We want to find these situations early. We don't want them to pop up at the last minute. The other thing I can say is that when you have your NEPA kickoff, invite your right-of-way folks. There are ways that we can help you condense your timelines. You can sometimes run your right-of-way concurrent with your NEPA, and so they're not necessarily gonna have to happen sequentially, and that can help you meet your overall ad date. And then the last thing that I wanna point out, some of you are agencies that participate in the region road maintenance program and that can be used in lieu of an ESA consultation to satisfy your NIMFS ESA requirements. Um, most likely it's going to be your maintenance staff, so probably not the people in this room, but your maintenance staff will have made this arrangement with NIMFS. But if you are a participating agency, we can use that program on capital projects. NIMS does not differentiate between Pierce County Road Maintenance and Pierce County Engineering. You're all the same to them. So that is a very important tool that you have available to you. I keep a list of agencies that are participating in the program. And again, if you get us involved early, we can point these things out to you and maybe chart you on a different path so that hopefully we don't see too much of a schedule bust. But one and a half to two years. Any questions on that? Getting no reaction. This must not be news to you. It is, de it's very depressing. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm serious, it is, and we've been, trying to figure out how to manage this. And we've been meeting with NIMS and Federal Highways and NIMS and I have been meeting about this to try to figure out what do we do. Um, yeah, it's, there's preliminary talks of a programmatic, but I just, it's all been talked so far. Any other reactions? All right, you get Dave back. There, there was a question. Oh. So given this, how are we going to work with ESRC's program delivery and maintenance, you know, keeping obligation dates given this? 
we're going to do that that um, work back with obligation dates and program delivery and deliver by year budgets. Is that a straight question for me? Oh. Um, <laughs> I think that's a great question, and I think, you know, I, I've heard bits and pieces of this message, but it's the first time I've heard it so concisely and clearly in a lot, so thank you for that. And I think, you know, as the MPO, especially as we're doing new project selection processes and looking at our annual delivery, we're going to also have to make sure that, um, and I'll, I'll put it back with our countywide chairs groups to help us, right. but, yeah, see what you're doing there, um, to help us really clearly evaluate projects when they come to us to begin with. And I think that's a big message that we wanted to, to get out to today um, is really making sure because we're not at the MPO, we're not project experts. So understanding that when we see projects, we're not sure if we're going to be able to know if they're going to need NIFS review, but making sure that you know a six month NEPA process probably needs a second look and that type of thing. You can contact me and I can put you in touch with a guy named Gregor Meyer in our office. And if anyone, is there anyone from Everett in the house? No one's from Everett. Okay. Um, King County? Okay. Those are the two main local agency players that have gotten the program up and running. Um, I see you talking with Max. Are you with Snohomish County? Yes. You are 4D. Oh, yeah. You're already in it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. So that's going to cover a wide range of projects. You'll get um, everything up to bridge replacement. Um, the main things that are going to kick you out of coverage are going to be adding capacity, so vehicular capacity, and pile driving. During construction, those are going to be the main things, and obviously marine work, but we're not focusing on that today. Follow up question, and I'll just use. This. So, to get on the list, is it is it some review of the maintenance program to see that it meets the 4D requirements? What what does it take? So, the 4D program is essentially a carrot and a stick, and agency applies to NIMS and the road maintenance program. What they agree to do is train their maintenance staff in fish friendly, best management practices, fish exclusion, erosion and sediment control, construction site management. They also agree to do annual reporting of their projects to NIMS. In exchange, they do not have to do Endangered Species Act consultations for a large subset of their agency work. But it relies very heavily on the maintenance staff involvement. So that's the, the one piece that is going to be a little variable depending on how your agency is structured. Hang on, I'm going to get you the microphone. Go so you described the project description on the step. I have to say anything about the conversation that you read the right way to do it or you have to As far as the step goes, this is probably sufficient. Because you don't know. When you're planning a, a project and you, you have a dream, you're applying for the money, you, you're not gonna necessarily know. It's when you get a little bit more into design and you get some more engineers looking at it that you realize, oh, oh we got a problem. So that's why when, when you know of a project, that's why we ask that you get us involved early. Thoughts? Questions? Angst. <laughs> All right, I'm going to give you back to Dave. Okay, back to uh, thanks, Melanie. Back to uh, talking about preliminary engineering that are required for it. So, 
Uh, before Melanie came up, I was talking about the requirement to construct a project. So this um, next bullet is uh, about that. So once we spend federal money on a project, it has to be constructed. Um, the only exception to that is that if we get through the NEPA process, we can complete the NEPA process and uh, the no build option from NEPA is actually selected. That's the only way we can get around not having to repay federal funds. So, but other than that, if you start it and if for some reason you can't complete your project, uh, we will be requesting those federal funds to be that have been reimbursed to you to be repaid. Next thing, uh, this is a federal requirement, is once we start design, we're required, or the project is required to advance to the next phase within 10 years. Um, so if the project has a right of way, you have to advance to right of way within 10 years. If there's no right of way, then we're required to advance to construction within 10 years. If for some reason this can't be made, we can request an extension from federal highways but we do have to have a sufficient reason to, to grant that. Um, right away, um, again, if, we, if you have right away on a project and we spent federal dollars on it, you're gonna have to uh, acquire your right away using following the right away manual and the Uniform Relocation Act. And by America, it will apply to your project with federal funds in the PE phase. Uh, any questions on design, PE? All right. So next um, phase is right away. Um, so right away is not only acquisition, but it also includes any permits or easements that are required to construct the project. So any any of those items, we have to uh, follow the right away. Uh, section of the uh, lag manual, sorry, and uh, Uniform Relocation Act. So documentation required for the for authorization of the right-of-way phase, again, step documentation. All of our projects have to be in the current approved step. The project prospectus. So this would only be required at right-of-way if right-of-way is your first phase, or if for some reason there's been a change in scope uh, between when we authorize PE and have moved to right-of-way. So if we have PE authorized, right away is a new phase. There are no scope changes, termini, those types of elements. You don't have to uh, provide a new prospectus at that time. Uh, we're gonna have to have approved right away plans. If your project has relocation, uh, we'll need to have an approved relocation plan. NEPA documentation, so environmental has to be approved before we can authorize a right-of-way phase. We will need a right-of-way estimate that details where the right-of-way costs are coming from. And again, a completed checklist. So we'll, all, we'll always, always gonna ask for a checklist just to make sure it gives everybody an opportunity to make sure that everything's been included. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is the actual right-of-way estimate, the fund, right-of-way funding estimate, right-of-way in general. But um, we're going to have Michelle Newlane, who's uh, the right-of-way manager for local programs in Olympia. She's going to, obviously, much more of an expert than I am, but she's going to talk about right-of-way for the uh, next couple of slides. So where's the fancy button? Just on the mouse. Okay. Good morning. Um, oh, I guess I need to step closer to the microphone. Um, good morning. I'm Michelle Newlene, as Dave um, told you, and I am the local programs right away manager. And I wanted to talk to you about some of the things that um, we're facing in um, right away. So I work with the local agency coordinators on getting your projects certified for construction. So my first tidbit for you is to please um, make contact with your local agency coordinators early in the process. It's a lot easier for them to spot check your offer letter packages and all of that prior to them being sent out and then discovering later on um, that we have a problem. 
And one of the things that we're always doing in the right-of-way section is looking for ways to improve our process. Right now, the right-of-way phase typically takes about a year, which seems like a long time, and it is, but we're dealing with people and their property rights, and that takes time to negotiate. Um, you can see that your time frame can be less than a year if you have a simplistic right-of-way phase with not a lot of acquisitions. But on the flip side of that, you can have complex acquisitions that need to take place, and that could easily get extended way past the year into two or three years, especially if you have a property owner that is not willing to settle and you end up going to condemnation. Um, we recently worked with an agency who has all of their acquisitions completed. They've been working on it for two years, and they have one property owner that is refusing to sign anything, including a possession and use. So um, we're working with Federal Highways right now to see if we can get approval for a CERT three accepted parcel so that it won't hold up um, them moving on to construction. Um, but they're going to be filing a condemnation suit after two years of trying to work with this property owner. So you need to make sure that you have adequate time in your project to cover those types of things. One of the areas that we're looking at right now at improving is the right-of-way funding estimate. So to give you a little bit of history right now, based on the lag, there's two methods that can be used. The first one is the project funding estimate. And this one, well, both of them are tied to how you come up with the value of the properties that you're gonna be um, acquiring. So the first one under the project funding estimate, I kind of see this as your really complex way of putting together what your funding estimate's gonna look like. But then on the flip side, we tell you, well, you put all this effort into putting this PFE together. So now we're gonna tell you that you can do administrative offer summaries instead of full-blown appraisals. And those are allowed on any property that is non-complex and is valued at $25,000 or less. So you kind of have more time and effort and expense in the PFE and maybe can save some time and um, effort and money on the appraisal side of things by having internal staff do these AOSs. The other method that's out there right now that's allowed is the true cost estimate. And this one saves you time and money on putting together your estimate. It's a much more simplistic approach. But if you use that one, we say, well, now you have to get everything appraised. You can't use the AOS method. So it's kind of a flip. You kind of save money on one, but then could have more expense and time in the other. So what we've been trying to do is come up with a method that will um, be more cost effective for everybody and save time. So the new process that's gonna be coming out soon, we're calling it a right-of-way funding estimate. And like I said, the reason we're leaning towards this is we need to simplify the process. We needed to come up with a way that um, we weren't putting so much effort and time into completing these and come up with a form that's much easier for everybody to use. Um, we also wanted to create uniformity so that there wasn't two methods that were tied to the valuation process. We wanted to move forward with just one way of putting together the project funding estimate or now the right-of-way funding estimate. And we also wanted to look at cost effectiveness. We had several agencies in the past year that have contacted us and shared stories with us where they have been contracting out um, to appraisal to appraisers for their PFP. And in some cases, um, I know one agency contacted us and said they spent $30,000 to have their PFE completed to find out that their right-of-way costs were gonna be 15,000. That just doesn't seem right. Um, so we wanted to address that. And we also wanted to come up with a way that the agency um, could complete the project funding estimate or the right-of-way funding estimate. It's gonna take a while to get that changed in my mind um, so that it didn't have to be contracted out to an appraiser if they wanted to do it in-house or hire a consultant to do it that doesn't necessarily a licensed appraiser. And let's see if I can get to the next slide. I did it. Okay. So with the right-of-way funding estimate, we actually used the true cost estimate spreadsheet as our starting point, and then we embedded some calculations in it. So this one-stop shop is gonna have these embedded calculations in it, and it's gonna be a based on assessed value. So there won't be the need to go pull comparable cells or do a whole lot of that in order to come up with what you think your or what your acquisition is going to cost you. Um, we then added one of the embedded calculations is a competency level. 
when you look at the assessed value that you find for the property, how confident are you? Does it seem like it's way below market in what you're seeing, or are you pretty confident that's in line? So you can put that ratio in, and the form will automatically calculate an increase to that to cover what any difference there might be if the assessed value is above, below, or right on the mark. The next one is the condemnation percentage. This one is actually already embedded in the true cost estimate. So on this one, you would just put what you are typically have experienced historically on your condemnation. You can also roll in a little bit of how confident you are in um, having already had contact with the property owner, um, maybe knowing in the past if you've had a lot of owners that have not wanted to work with your agency. So you can kind of look at that and decide historically, do you have a lot of um, condemnation or are you really able to negotiate in your community and um, reach an agreement? The last one is the market change. So we always know that the market is going up and down. So when you're putting this right away funding estimate together, um, what year are you putting it together and when do you actually think you're gonna be out there working with the property owners to acquire their property? So that's an embedded percentage in there to cover it. Um, here's what the form's gonna look like. It was really big to try to fit it on a slide. So I didn't have much success there, but I do have a link down there that's also very long, but um, I'm hoping that you guys can write that down, take a look at it. I would love any feedback that you have um, related to that form. Please feel free to share it with your staff. We'll turn the slides out, don't worry. We don't, oh yeah. Just a quick question. This link in the form will be in our web, uh, local programs website. I haven't put it out on the website yet. This is, I worked with our IT person, so it's out there, but I don't really know how he did it. He tried to explain it to me and it went, I just but, um, yeah, so um, I can definitely send it out to you, um, but this will take you to the form, but I don't think if you go to our webpage right now, it will show. We're still trying to work out when we're going to implement the new form. We're still waiting on feedback from a couple people that we have shared it with some agencies we wanted to see what they thought of it so we're still trying to gather all of that information back and the final step in switching to this form because it is going to be a change in approach is that we're going to be putting i believe it's going to be a webinar training but we haven't exactly um, settled on that yet that we will be setting up webinars or some sort of training so that we can go over the use of this form and what you would do if the property you're acquiring doesn't have an assessed or a tax parcel number assigned to it, how you can use the abutting property um, to come up with a price per square foot and some other little tricks to help you get through the process. This will still allow you to use the appraisal. Okay. Yes. So, so, hang on, sorry. Okay. The folks on the webinar have used the mic and it says, if the presenter would be so kind as to perhaps Okay. Will this process still allow you to use the appraisal waiver? Absolutely. So instead of having, like I said, the two separate processes, it's just going to be one process and the form will actually have you put in here um, when you're estimating whether you think you're going to have expense in the appraisal or if you'll be doing an AOS. So um, both methods will still be allowed. Great question. Yeah. For a lag change? So the question is, is this going to require a lag change? And absolutely. That's one of the things that um, we're going to have to look at the entire lag and see every time we have a project funding estimate referred to and get that changed, as well as there'll be major rewrites to Chapter 25 of the lag. Yeah. When do you anticipate that change? That's a really good question. When was the change going to take place? Um, it was, it's all going to depend on when we can get these webinars set up. I, you know, I'd love to say January 1st, but I doubt that we'll be able to pull that off. But we're we're making great strides in getting this ready and available. So hopefully sooner than later. Okay. And then the last area I wanted to talk about today is temporary easements. Oh. So a question, one thing that we've had some challenges with lately Project has a really wide right away, and we don't even get close to the edge of the right away, but we have to clear the entire right away. So if there is a fence or anything else, we have to make sure that we 
get rid of all encumbrances into the right of way we have federal funds. That has become a real difficulty, of course, dealing with property owners, especially when it does the project doesn't even near and there's no need to remove that. I know that's a federal rule, but it's been uh, difficult lately. And we have had several agencies recently who have been dealing with encroachment issues and they are not fun. That is a very true statement. A lot of people say, well, my fence has been there was there when I bought the house or, you know, when I moved on and, but still you do have to clear the right away. So the next area is um, temporary easements. A lot of times these are called temporary construction easements. And so we've been trying to move away from that because TCE, um, people get confused between temporary construction easement and true cost estimate. Since we're gonna be revamping the um, method for doing our estimate on the right-of-way phase, it probably would resolve itself. But again, we're trying to move to just calling them temporary easements. And the question we always get is, why does something that sounds so easy turn into such a big deal? And I mean, you think about it, it's just a temporary right. You're not gonna be needing it for very long. This should just be a slam dunk. But there are a lot of things that contribute to the fact that TCEs, or TEs, let's see, uh, take a lot of time and one of them again is the human factor. You're still dealing with a property owner and you're still acquiring a right from them whether it is temporary or permanent and some property owners just are not interested in negotiating and settling on these and they can take a lot of time. It can take as much as if you were acquiring a, a permanent right from a property owner. The other issue that comes uh, um, that happens quite often is floating time frames and appraising. You, know, you have to look at how are you going to be using this property? What exactly do you need? Are you going to be on the property or are you just needing to hold that right for maybe a year and a half and you're only going to physically be using the property for um, six months? These are the types of things that you need to be looking at and thinking about. And we've also been experiencing a lot of, of temporary easements that are expiring before construction can get done. There's project delays, you have acquired an, a um, temporary easement for two years, but then you find out that you actually are gonna need an additional six months, and that means you're going out and you're reacquiring a new TCE for that six months, and that may require reappraising it, a new AOS, getting a new document drafted, it's a lot of work. So some of the solutions to these issues are, is like I mentioned, make sure you have adequate time to acquire these rights from property mm -hmm. owners. Um, you can also, you need to work closely with your appraiser. Talk to them about what exactly it is you're going to be doing on the property, how you're going to be on it. You know, you can work with your appraiser to see if they can come up with two different values. A value for when you just want to hold on, you're not going to be on the property, but you want to have that right so that they do not construct something within the TCE, so then you're having to worry about um, removing a fence, these types of things but then you're only physically gonna be using the property for a certain amount of time. So maybe you could pay a higher rate for that time when you're actually gonna have boots on the ground. These are things that you need to discuss with your appraiser. The other thing that would be really helpful is if you went ahead and drafted that temporary easement. What is it gonna look like? Share that with your appraiser, go over it. This will help them fully understand what it is that you're needing to acquire from this property owner, what your expectations are, so you're on the same page for evaluating um, your needs. One of the things that goes back to the issue with the expiration before construction is we're currently working on determining if we can add a paragraph to our template form that would automatically allow for an extension. Um, I've done some preliminary work on this. It sounds like it is legally possible, but again, this would be conversations to have with your appraisal or appraiser at the time because it would involve knowing um, which form you're going to do. Are you just going to say, we have the option to extend for six months and this is the rate that we would pay for that six months? Does your appraiser feel comfortable doing that? Is the market changing so quickly that that's not feasible? Um, the other thing would be to have it say it would be an extension of six months, but it would be reevaluated and market value would be paid for that extension and then you would then engage your appraiser again to determine what rate would need to be paid for that extension. These types of things, um, if we can get that language approved and get it in our template would save you from having to go back out to these property owners and start the process over again to get an entirely new document. 
Um, so hopefully by the time our annual right-of-way meetings roll around, um, I think the first ones are in February, we will have a resolution to that and we'll be sharing that new language and um, what we've been able to come up with for it. Are there any questions about temporary easements? Oh. Hi, uh, I just had a quick question about uh, mitigation uh, areas that, that are required to be mitigated as part of a project, like we have uh, some um, mitigation or, or similar areas that we have to maintain for years. And there was a discussion of whether that's considered a temporary easement or it's considered a permanent easement the length of time that you need to continually monitor and uh, make sure that that piece of property um, held in their environment that was based on your uh, biological assessment or growth plan by operating. So uh, I guess the question is, we were kind of we were kind of directed that it should be a temporary easement, uh, but it would just seem so strange to have a 12 year temporary easement. Has there been any talk about that? It's a uh, permanent. There's been a lot of talk about that. <laughs> and um, to fall back on Federal Highways and Dave Lee Howe, it depends. Um, there is really no definition for a temporary easement. They can go on um, for 10 years, 12 years. It depends on the use. So, um, I mean, we would have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis, but it is not unheard of to have a temporary easement that would go on for a decade. It's all about the use and what the agency would need it for, and it would need to be um, evaluated. That's a really good thing to pull your local agency coordinator in on um, early in the process so that you can figure out what exactly um, should be acquired for those types of situations, whether it should be a permanent easement or a temporary. Okay, well, thank you, and I'm going to turn things back over to Dave. Okay, so getting back to uh, documentation for the right-of-way phase, um, as far as compliance is concerned, again, uh, monthly billing. We need to see the consistent billing. Yeah, and environmental com uh, commitments uh, must be incorporated into your right-of-way and construction phases. Again, if, if the project is continuing or is taking a while, once you have NEPA approval, it does have to be reevaluated every three years. And the, the big one is right-of-way certification. So once we spend money, federal money in the right-of-way phase, we have to get the uh, right-of-way certified. Um, in the right-of-way phase, um, quite often the expenditure doesn't happen until the property is acquired or you have a property owner. Um, do activities that involve, say, the agency staff that in the process of negotiating things like are they qualified for right away billing so they can send those expenditures, or is it purely right away acquisition and appraisal and things like that? Well, no, it, it's certainly eligible, but a lot of it's going to depend on how the right away phase was set up on the local agency agreement. Certain times the uh, agreement won't have money for agency staff because it wasn't requested for agency staff. So then that takes me to the next suggestion for those who are listening. If you want to stay out of that monthly billing warning that you get every night, you have a right away phase. Perhaps you should consider putting some agency staff time, things like that, in the right away phase and bill so you don't have to get on that. Nine month clock that's okay. um, so more federal requirements. Um, like with PE, if once we start spending money, uh have spent money in the PE or I'll be I have a question. Um and I'm gonna talk about this. Our design around that. Shell Way uh, in Tacoma, um, we had a lot of right of way challenges. One of the things we really struggled with 
um, is, and I was hoping the next slide was going to talk about construction permits. Um, the difference between when you need a TCE versus when you need a construction permit. And my understanding is we can only have a construction permit or use the construction permit if the property owner comes to us and says, please make my driveway entrance a little bit smoother. Or, and these are for driveways. These are for patching back in. I mean, in most cases on our project, relatively flat project, although we really want to leave the property owner then, I mean, the construction is hard enough. And so we don't want to bump in their driveway. Really. One of the things we're always told is um, only get a TCE if you absolutely need it. Well, we can build the majority of the project without any TCEs. That may not leave the property owner in the state that we would like to leave them in. And that gets in a whole other process in, in tracking down these property owners who are sometimes trusts located in Florida and Texas and everywhere else with family members that don't talk to each other. And we have to work all this out for a five foot patch of asphalt pavement. Once that's on our right of way plans, we generally can't pull it off our right of way plans. They do this So we're kind of caught in between. Uh, I can go on. I don't know how much more time I can speak later, but <laughs> so this is a topic that's been brought up multiple times. Um, we've actually had day-long training on TCE and permits, but the permit is allowed if you are just doing minor feathering for a driveway. If the project's really not impacting the property owner and it's just you know, they come to you and say, you know, there's just a um, that's going to be there, can you just kind of feather it out? That's when the permit is okay. If you're actually talking about a major grade change where you're going to be going feet onto the property owner's um, property in order to feather that out, then you need to start looking at the TCEs. Okay, so sorry, I'm a little passionate about this one. Um, I believe there was a requirement of lack in any one. This versus that. So to get to that point where the property owner approaches you, as opposed to trying to coerce the property owner into not moving forward the TCE that they could potentially get paid for, it's kind of late in the project at that point, right? And we can't bring that up. So now we're forced to get TCEs if we really want to do a good job or leave the bump there. And it's kind of a catch-22. We you know, and then on Taylor Way, if we don't get all these easements, we're told the project isn't going forward. We have $18 million of grants hanging out for the region, and we're on a very tight time frame. And I appreciate everybody working with us on that. Both the programs was great. Uh, but it was it was a really challenging situation. And, and I don't think the way that's set up, it's really beneficial to cities, the property owners. It adds more time to the process. I don't mind paying the money, but you know, when you have to track these folks down all over the country and get aunts and uncles to talk to each other because these corporations are, you know, either in bankruptcy or going into bankruptcy. I mean, there's all these other issues because we want to put a five foot patch, you know, and just make their approach better. So if and I don't is this a consistent policy across all the regions or is it is it the Olympic region that really is focusing on this? I, mean, I would just like to hear more about it. And is there a better way that we can improve the process? And I'm not trying to get around the whole Uniform Act. Um, I just, you know, I want to make things to go forward, and, and I want everybody to have the best. I definitely think it's an area where we could do some clarification on. It gets really tricky though because right now the way the VAG is written and what we have through the Uniform Act is that if what you're leaving the property owner with is acceptable, then you, if, if the property owner can walk away, you can walk away and leave the property owner whole and you're just talking about that money. You're talking about again something major where if you were to walk away and not do anything, you're leaving them in a situation that was different than when project started, then you're talking about a TCE. It is a very gray area. It's almost going to end up being a case 
basis, but it is definitely something where this isn't just an Olympic region issue. This is a statewide issue. Um, very, we have a lot of agencies that are passionate about this, but they've been struggling with it. And I do think we need to provide better clarification and that's something we need to do in the future. Okay, um, so again, federal requirements for right away. Um, we have a 10 year rule that they now must advance to construction within 10 years, and then also uh, Buy America again. Once the federal funds are on the project, Buy America is applicable. Now, in the last uh, phasing, is construction phase, the documentation again is very similar to the other's current step. Um, project prospectus, this is required at all construction authorizations. So whether it's a new project or just a new phase of an existing project, we always have to have a, the, uh, a new project or an updated project prospectus. The local agency agreement, if it's a new project, it'll be the, the original, the five-pager. If it's a supplement, it'll be the uh, two-page. Environmental documentation, so we have to have NEPA approval before we can authorize construction, and the right-of-way certification. We have to have the uh, the cert done before we can authorize right-of-way. Uh, engineer's estimate. So this is this the estimate we use for construction is the engineer's estimate. That's uh, just another federal requirement to have a documented cost estimate. Uh, the DBE goals and training goals have to be assigned. If there are any public interest findings, those are, <clears throat> excuse me, public, the PEPs, we, we need those approved before we can authorize construction. So those would be for tied bids. Uh, if local forces are going to be doing the project instead of through uh, competitive bidding. And then propri proprietary items, those currently require a PEF. However, the, uh, there, there is a process change in place that should, won't be updated until the, the uh, next lag update. Um, but the PIF for proprietary items will no longer be required, but there will be a uh, uh, certification that the agencies have to provide that the, the items are meeting by America. So that was the original direction by Federal Highways. Federal Highways is now in discussions with WashDOT on how do we, do we still need a PIF uh, um, or not? And so I know there's discussions with Kyle McKeon and, and um, Susan Wimberly at FHWA on how are we going to move forward with this? Are we still going to require it or not? We just don't want anybody to get into trouble with the Buy America because that's such a small amount and some of those proprietary items, we just, you still have to have the Buy America standard. So stay tuned for more, because that changed just this Monday. So sorry about that. And as far as documentation, again, another uh, completed checklist. The monthly billing, uh, environmental commitments, again, have to be incorporated into the project by America and then Davis-Bacon wage rates and the policy, the DOT policy is those rates um, are need to be pulled within 10 days of the advertisement date for your construction contract. So, any questions? Yes.
really think that it's a possibility to tie bids or we just don't want to get down the process too far where we you know combine all these these two projects together and then have to separate them because we didn't get approval So you do need approval. You have to send in a, is it a PIF? Is that what we, yeah. You still have to send in a PIF. There was a general rule that it's like a 20% savings, but it's really about, is it the right thing to do and why? And justifying why you're doing it. So that's all because you could have started with them together as well. But if it's, you know, if there's a benefit to the traveling public, you know, financial benefit, that's what we're looking for. And it's, I just start crafting it and send it, I don't know who you're with, Auburn. Yeah, and I'd send it through um, Murdod shop and then we can start looking at it. That would be on Kyle's side as well, but they can start looking at it and see where, if there's additional documentation we need, but it's just, why is this the best thing to do? And that's all we're trying to do because a lot of times the contractors will look, okay, maybe they won't look at this stuff, but they could be thinking of the projects and saying, oh, so there's these opportunities where we have on other agencies who will split projects so that they can have two separate contractors working together thinking it'll get done faster. So we've seen it done both ways. So it's just, you know, being upfront about what you're trying to do. That's what I would suggest. Okay. Okay, so one of the things Kelly and I have talked about is about timing and how long should people be estimating a phase will take. So we've tried to give some general perspective, you know, suggestions I'll say. One of the big things is I just reviewed the dip that's out on the web now for public comment and when I see a project and the design, the right of way and the construction funding all shows 2020, I already know it's not going to happen. So it's really trying to put in perspective what we should see. A straight, as we all know, I haven't seen many straightforward pavers lately because it always seems like, oh yeah, well, we forgot. And so it's really the general rule is you start off with a year and then you start thinking about, are they gonna hire, is the agency gonna hire a consultant to do the design? Well, you've got two months or so to get the advertisement out for the consultant, to evaluate them and then select them and get them under contract. So right there, you're in three months. So you thought it was gonna take a year, now you're down to nine months before you even begin the design. And so it's trying to think about those items and then what Melanie was talking about on the environmental documentation, what all do you need to consider there? And if you're talking a year and a half, then there, I mean, you're not even gonna make it to right away in the following year. So. And then coordination with others, be it railroad, be it other state agencies, other permitting agencies, and just trying to be realistic about when you can go. Now we all then back up to, well, I did the call for projects and I got money for this year. Well, I'm gonna put it in that year because that's the year I gotta put it in. But it is, it's really getting back to how much time should I be expecting a phase to take. And so right now the minimum is a year and then you consider how you're going to deliver the project just for that particular phase. So when you're looking at right away, again, as Michelle was explaining, you've got one year. And then you have to look at, again, if you're hiring a consultant or appraisers or any of those entities to help assist your teams in delivering it, then what types of projects, potential litigation. I have, I think we have a couple projects that are in litigation and their court cases don't even have dates into 2020 yet. 
and uh, their construction was programmed for 2019. So we already know that's in the new step and they're hoping for 2020, but so there's that. And then looking at construction, you know, you first base that on your working days, but you've got your advertisements and then finally getting execution. Then if you have a fish window and then the one item that keeps dropping up is plan establishment, Max. So um, <laughs> you can tell, I know who certain people are, but plan establishment, even if you have plan establishment, you're still required to, to keep it financially active. And what we've said on plan establishment as a general rule is that I should be seeing a reimbursement every six months. I know they're not going out there every month, so Jim, in this instance, this is what we've said, but you should be getting some kind of expenditure within every six months prior to close. And then there's always the winter shutdown, and if you do a winter shutdown, it's just notifying the region local programs engineers so that they can put a note so that if I get it on the inactive, but for winter shutdown, if you're Billing me monthly, it shouldn't hit inactive. So it's trying to figure out that's your timeline. And then as Dave had talked about on the project agreement end dates on the local agency agreement, every time we authorize a phase, you, you all have to put in the end date. And what we recommend in the lag is after you've gone through and said, okay, Design's gonna take me a year, then I have all those other items. So let's say it's two years. So it comes into my office January of 2020. Design's gonna take two years. Then you add three. So your project agreement end date should be 2025 for the design phase. Of course, you don't have to wait till 2025 to move forward on right away or construction. But that gives you a buffer so that if you have a two-year window, we're trying to give you for those oops or you run into a complication that you didn't even think would be your in your project, you have a little bit of a buffer because to get that agreement end date approved and extended, it has to be, you know, an unforeseen circumstance and you have to adequately justify it, submit a sub supplement, and then I get to submit it to Federal Highways and explain why they should approve it. So we're trying to put those dates out there so we don't have to worry about it. So I'm just trying to give you, you know, these are, we got the three years, so think about when you're gonna be done and then add three years. So that gives you enough time to get that phase completed. So, can we do a minute? So, so that's kind of on the timing. So then when you program it in the STIP, you should align the STIP years or that then align with the two years for design, two years for right away, so that you'd have 2020 for design, 2022 for right away, and then 2024, that would be too many years. But. And remember in the STIP, your phases have to be fully funded. And if PSRC only gave you a third of the money and you're still looking where another third is coming from, then it's not fully funded. The phase has to be fully funded or reasonably available thinking that you're going to get it. So just as a reminder, so some common obstacles. So project progress. We've emphasized and emphasized, and Rick Judd from Federal Highways will also emphasize an activity and not advancing a project and submitting reimbursements. Setting uh, unrealistic milestone dates, like all three years, you're gonna do design right away and construction, and not not allowing sufficient time for reviews, approvals, and deadlines. So 
I always give Kelly a bad time that her is an obligation. Is your deadline in December? Don't you have a December if you give them an extension? Right. So the extension deadline is December. That's all fine and good, but my team is not going to work on Christmas to get your deadline. So just so you know, no, my team's not doing that. So you all have to look at your deadlines and understand that once it gets to my shop, we have two weeks to process. Federal Highways has five days. Once we send it down, they have five days to authorize. So put that, back that up, and if it's during that Christmas holiday, it's on you. It's and on Kelly. It's not on Kelly, so just to clarify. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Meeting our deadline means you've submitted the to WashCon, so it's not final. So Merry Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> but, and Dave just went through all the documentation for every phase and what we're seeing, you know, to be able to authorize it. So a complete package means that you have met all those things. And that's why it's kind of one of those Keep going back to chapter 14. What do I need for each phase? Go to the checklist. What do I need for each phase? And if we have it, we can put it together and send it down. So there's the reviews, approvals, the death, and then scheduling ads in the summer. What we did see, we, we were talking to um, agencies on the east side earlier this week, and they had a lot of summer ads. And all of them, I think the highest amount in the South Central Yakima uh, Tri-City area, we had over six projects that have are now going back to add. They either didn't get bidders or bids came in too high or they had one bidder and they could not award because they just couldn't meet the deadline. So just a heads up that that's what we found on that side this last summer. So we talked about the incomplete fund authorization packages. We're getting estimates. I think Dave went through. We have to have detailed estimates. FHWA requires they come over to our files and look, why did you authorize two and a half million dollars? And now we have a detailed estimate that supports that. So we're okay, let's see. And then, of course, everybody loves the stip. So, and not having your project in it or your project phases in it, and specifically not having the right scope. So it's imperative that you have the right scope, that your environmental aligns with what we have authorized in federal highways. And that's one of the big things is that when we do go out and do final inspections, we're looking at the scope of work that was authorized. If you've removed um, items of work or not, and that hasn't been updated, Federal Highways is expecting that you did everything we authorized. So, and um, I think I talked about, I'll write you down. Is the next one mine? Talk about this one. So this slide is um, it, it's basically all related to the local agency agreement, and it, and uh, really trying to uh, just focus on certain things on the document that we see a lot of issues with, and you know one of the biggest things we see are just common math errors. You know two numbers don't add up to the total, the federal funds, the local funds, and when we add them together, we, they don't match what, what you're showing is the total cost. Um, or uh, totals between phases don't, don't add up. So it's difficult for us to um, figure out what we're trying to do on those. And if there's a math error, we're going to have to correct it. And if we have to correct it, we have to go back to the agency and ask for permission to make any changes on the document since it is a legally binding document. So um, those are the type of things that cause um, quite a bit of delay sometimes. Um, 
So individual lines with incorrect federal participation ratios. This a lot of times has to do with rounding and with STP funds, for example, with an 86.5% ratio, a lot of times the dollars don't come out exactly equal because it's to the penny. And, and we don't want you to put it onto the penny. We, you know, this is a, they're still estimates. Um, so we, we need the numbers rounded, but we do see a lot of times where, you know, on, with 86.5, we might see a line that's 86.8%. And we, we physically cannot authorize that. We can't go above the federal maximum shares. So you know, those things need to be, um, we need to make sure that the, the, the ratios, again, it's an, a math issue. On supplements, at the top of the supplement, we are saying that we are modifying the original supplement, and we ask for the original supplement execution date, and that is the date the very first LA was signed by, typically it's gonna be Stephanie. So when we sign it, it's not the day that necessarily lines up with the actual federal authorization. Those quite often are different, Federal authorization usually follows a couple of days after the date the LA agreements are signed. Um, in, incorrect date format, so we need to see month, date, and year for like the project agreement end date, add dates. So just a month and a year is not going to work. We have to see all three. Um, one, another problem on existing projects when we're moving money between lines or between phases is actually reducing an amount below existing expenditures. So a bill has already been submitted, we've already paid it, and then um, and the supplements received and that, that line is actually being reduced below what's, what's spent. Um, we can't do those. Uh, we can't process that if um, that happens. Um, so again, round, please round amounts to the nearest dollar. Uh, we don't set up pennies. It, again, it's it's still an estimate, even though we ask you to round to the nearest whole dollar. Um, it still is an estimate, and the pennies is just a, a level of you know exactness that doesn't exist there really. Um, add dates. So when we get a construction authorization request, that's the only time you need to provide an add date. You don't have to provide an ad date during your PE or right away phase. It's just in the construction phase. But a lot of times we see an ad date that uh, by the time we get the package, we're already past the proposed ad date. So we can't have that. And the other side of the, the coin is that we might see an ad date that three months out. Um, our policy is six weeks, or, or you're required to go to ad within six weeks construction authorization. Um, end dates that don't follow the lag guidance, which Stephanie covered, and that's determining when you think your phase is going to end and then adding three years to that date. Uh, a lot of times we get end dates that um, are within the current year or maybe only a year out, and that just doesn't provide uh, enough flexibility for the project. Um, updating PE and right away costs, this is something that we don't see a lot of. As we're off the rides construction and PE and right away costs are not being looked at. So we might have a lot of money left in PE or a lot of money left in the right away phase and can't have that money just sitting there. Um, um, the biggest thing is that closure when we close a project. Several of them, have, uh, we, you know, we're, we're releasing hundreds of thousands of dollars and. Uh, that's, that actually doesn't meet federal federal law, which is the next bullet point is um, when your federal costs on a project decrease by $250,000 or more, you are required to submit a sub supplement to update your estimate. And that will um, meets federal law, it's in the CFR, um, and it's a requirement that that has to happen. So again, these are just some of the some of the issues that we see on a on a somewhat regular basis. Any questions? I do have a question. Um, thanks for calling again. Um, we love to receive the letters from Stephanie Tax that tell us that we're getting money. Um, and in those letters, it does say you have six weeks to go to add. Yes. I've also heard that the date that really governs is the date in your 
agreement or prospectus that you're submitting for that phase that is generally could be the advertising day farther longer than the six weeks that's in our contract I guess with the state does that make any sense or is it truly the six weeks it, it's the it's the six weeks the estimate and the prospectus that we're not we're not really looking at that it's not being held you're not being held to anything on that estimate date okay. in the prospectus we put a date there when we expect to go ahead yes you're required to for all three phases when the start dates are for all three phases total cost for all three phases but the the ad date it's it's based off of construction authorization federal construction authorization so in the letter when we say your construction phase is authorized as of that date that's the date that starts the six weeks and that's the date on the letter yes okay what happens if an agency misses that um, I'm just curious. generally speaking nothing um uh, if if it's seven weeks you know you're not going to get another letter that says you you know broke law or something like that but what we find is that a lot of projects get authorized and then advert you know the projects aren't advertised for six months and that's not okay that's the problem that we're having because then we're, we're getting back into the inactive of projects that are authorized that are not moving they're not being advanced and that that is a big uh area issue area of concern with federal highways and and that's the state that we're not advancing projects oh. any other questions i have two questions um let's say hypothetically speaking that we have to uh a deadline to submit for construction uh, a construction obligation deadline by the end of this year. And uh, if I heard correctly, um, that being our construction obligation package needs to be complete by that day, or is it that the construction authorization letter needs to be uh, issued by, by then? It has a PSRC deadline question. For, so if you have PSRC is federal dollars and you have an obligation to be considered, you've met our deadline once you submit the package. And then we know that there's more time to process and finally obligated, but for our perspective, as long as you've done your due diligence, our deadline. Okay. Final well, complete, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to get at. And next follow-up question is, uh, when filling the um, supplement, uh, that we have to put the ad date and which would be within, should be within the six weeks after um, it has been approved, right? But it's, if we don't know what would be that date, yes, and we want to give as much possible when we, when we put that data in on the supplement. So how, what's a good rule of thumb we could use? So the rule of thumb is when you submit it and it's complete, you give it, you have to give us two weeks to process. So then six weeks from that two weeks, so eight weeks out is a good, you know, average, but give us two weeks to process, then we're expecting you to go to add within six weeks. Get it January 1st, by the end of February, you should be on that. Okay. Good morning. Uh, my name is Rick Judd. I'm with Federal Highway Administration, and I'm here. Uh, first of all, thanks for letting me come. And you know, one of the great things about being one of the Fed representatives is that you get to talk about all the things that you folks work on and dislike the most. So <laughs> I'm here to talk about all the things you don't want to hear about. You're kind of tired of hearing about, but I'm here to pester you about it. So um, with that, uh, I've got a couple slides here, and a lot of this is going to be driven by audits that we have been done or that we've done, uh, reviews that we've done. Some of you, your agencies have participated in the Improper Payments Act. Um, it's an annual audit nationwide. So 
either that or perhaps we've been out to your agency to do a billing review and we've come across things. What you're seeing up here are items or issues that have come up and we really want to put it on your radar screen and just make sure that you're aware of it and that you're looking at it so you don't get caught. Our role at Federal Highways, of course, is to work with WASDOT to make sure you folks, um, you know, you're complying with all the federal regulations and there's no surprises. Um, the first item that we do see, and I apologize, I'm going to look at the bigger font here, is that uh, just making sure that if you folks have uh, an overhead rate for billing overhead for your agency labor, um, that you're in compliance with 2 CFR 200. And the big thing we're seeing is um, we want to make sure that you have a drafted methodology and that you have a statement of certification that is right out of the back, one of the appendices of 2 CFR 200. I'm curious, how many local agencies here are billing overhead to their project? Oh, okay, so we have one. Uh, we seem to be seeing more agencies billing overhead, and so I was kind of curious. I thought there'd be more. Um, so along the same lines, when you're pulling in consultants, some issues that we're seeing is that um, we just want to make sure that you're ensuring that the consultant is using its currently approved indirect cost rate. Um, as many of you know, these, uh, these consultants have an annual approval process for their, um, for their overhead rates, unless they're using safe harbor. And what we do see at times is that we, when we go out, we find a lot of charges where the uh, a consultant is submitting, submitting their, uh, their bills to you folks, their invoices, and they're using their prior approved overhead rate. And, and, you know, it's important that you stay on top of that because even if you if you've paid the consultant for the for the rate that has <clears throat> is now currently approved rate, we're going to have to ask that you pull funds and back that out. So just want to make sure. And once again, these are things that we see when we go out to a local agency and um, we're looking at consultant charges. Uh, the, one of the other things with respect to consultants is we just want to make sure that um, you folks have, yeah, go ahead. So on consultant contract, we get, we enter into a contract and then we have a negotiated hourly rate. And um, that goes into the contract. And there's no contingency in the contract for the following year. You have a three-year consulting contract and you have a uh, negotiated hourly rate. The following year, the consultants get a pay but the contract is already established and it does not have this um, additional um, update or uh, allowances to update. So when we come out, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna look at that contract if we see anything that doesn't make sense to us. And if what I thought I heard you say is that the consultant is, is basically sending in charges for hours for staff at a rate that's higher than was permitted in the contract. That is not what I said. Okay. No. So, okay. but, but that that would be happening. What the consultant is doing in this case is asking us. Well, all of our, our employees got a 15, 20 percent raise, uh -huh. and we would. They're asking if they can charge at that rate. One of our answers has been sure, but we got to still be held to the bottom line. So now they got raises, we expect them to work twice as well, 15 percent harder. It doesn't seem, you know, that's not right. But if the initial contract, live contract, in the scope of work or in the agreement somewhere does not have an allowance for escalation of wages, do you not need to do, don't you need to do an amended contract? So, and I apologize. I'm going to, I have, this, this has come up in the past. And the first thing we do is we look at, does the contract allow for this? And this is really, if the contract allows for it, then we're going to deem it as proper. But it is up to the agency to monitor and to go back to the consultants. We're asking ourselves at Federal Highways when we're looking at this, and the auditors are looking at this in D.C., they're asking, does the contract allow for it? And what I heard you say is it does. So this is an area where we at Federal Highways say, agency, this is definitely one of your roles. 
And equally important that we find at times is that perhaps the contract was not written in a way that protects you, the agency, to have the ability to monitor and police and require um, something from the consultant in the event that they have all these wages, uh, wage increases. I'm not sure I'm answering your question. No, I think, I think the part to remember, you said here it's, you need to make sure that this is a currently approved ICR. Yeah, at the time you have it, but if you have a three year contract with that consultant, and that's pretty common that you do, that you don't forget about that increase in, uh, the increase in wages, especially if you have a negotiated hourly rate, if you have a cost plus, then maybe it doesn't change quite as much, but it's still the same situation. And what you're saying is these higher wages are getting rolled into the next year's annual uh, interior cost rate. And as long as that rate has been approved, it's their currently approved rate, then that's what they, they, um, they have rights to uh, be compensated for that. Okay, thank yeah. you. Any other questions? Consultant charges, I find for a lot of local agencies, consultant charges create a lot of headaches. Uh, my observation is just doing this through the years is that um, agencies are, uh, local agencies are very well equipped to take on traditional design bid build contracts. But when you start pulling in consultants uh, who are submitting a lot of invoices every month, uh, sometimes uh, the agency isn't quite sure on some of these issues. So, uh, and then when we walk in, the first thing we ask is, does the contract allow for it? And if it does, show me. And then that's where these headaches start coming up. So the next issue is everybody's favorite topic, and it's been named or it's been mentioned 35 times today, and it's called inactive projects. I, because you're in my office. 35 right. Times. So uh, I spend a lot of time with my brethren from local program, and uh, we talk a lot about this. Um, I really have to emphasize that there's very little sympathy in Washington, D.C. for this topic. Um, every quarter, uh, myself and my bosses receive um, basically uh, a report that shows the inactive uh, percentage for every single state. And the goal is staying below 2%, and most states stay below 1%. And Washington, in Washington, <laughs> we struggled at times to stay below 2%. And over the last six months, we've exceeded 2%. And I want to point out, I'm not here to create friction. I just, I'm here to emphasize that um, when Stephanie is sending you a letter about inactivity, that is because I am screaming at her, and that is because DC is screaming at my boss. And so all of this just runs right back to DOT, and then she comes out to you folks. So. When you're getting information or pushback from her as, what, as to why isn't this project spending, uh, that is coming from federal highways. And there are states like California that have extremely large local agency programs. California has over 800 local agencies delivering projects, and they stay below 1% um, routinely. And so this is a struggle for me, and I keep dumping it right on Stephanie's plate saying, how come we can't get down lower? So for folks uh, in the planning organizations, I ask a lot of questions about your processes, how you're allocating funds, and you know the unfortunate thing is every time this every time this inactivity grows, I am digging into your business, and it's just it makes your life more miserable. So it, 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 there needs to be an effort here, and the, the discussion on how often do we have to build, I have to ask you folks. When you have a federal aid project, charges that are eligible for reimbursement, please help me understand why you don't submit a bill. Please help me understand why at times agencies will hold on to a bill for a year before they submit a bill. Please help me understand that. Because the auditors asked me that and I said, I have no idea why the city of so-and-so or county so-and-so wants to float the federal government. That doesn't make sense to me. I, I need, anybody? Oh, 
the reason I hear from product managers is sometimes they don't have any billing for that particular month. So no issues there. The no issues thing. there. Yeah. And then no. the other thing is that it takes a long time to prepare this. So it's, and I think they've also heard from Washington, quarterly is okay. So we basically have been doing it on a quarterly basis. Yeah, that's where we got in trouble with our own finance department saying, no, you got an agreement that says monthly, so you have to do it monthly. But it's taking more of a project manager's time to actually prepare all that. Anybody else? Is it is it about costs and time? It co it takes more time and it's more costly to put together a bill on a routine basis than um, just hanging well, on to the charge. Okay, yeah, we're done. I have a, a variety of agencies in my region, to the big city of Seattle, to small towns that have a number of like less than a handful of staff. Uh, the ones I'm hearing from is they're so busy delivering the projects, working, and they've got this limited time, you know, fish windows, what have you, to work with. They're focusing on that, and this is one of the other things that typically falls on project managers' desk. And most of them are engineers that don't like to deal with finance stuff. Mm -hmm. So this is becomes their, their least favorite thing to do. So they prefer to go get the stuff done and get the road built, the sidewalk finished, what have you. And that's what it is basically. It's them being too overloaded at times and this is being kind of the last thing on their plates. And they're trying to get the project finished before end of the summer or before schools open or or, or some commitments they've made to the council or the mayor. Okay, yeah. Anybody else? I am the local <coughs> program that local agency that's made for a risk management for a risk management standpoint when you're trying to manage the project. Yeah. I function as a project engineer, project manager, city engineer, billing. So when you looking at the schedule, go, okay, if I don't do this, then I'm at risk of missing the ad date for fish window. Or if I don't do that now, then I'm missing an uh, opportunity to get the utilities start moving. Well, I know the money's going to be there. So every month it's really unrealistic with the job that I have and workload that I have. So I'm really shooting for quarterly so that it's consolidating the effort a little bit more. Because the money is there. Yeah, I don't want to float it. It's really no different than you doing your expense report. You know, every you got you got five dollar gas here, you got ten dollar parking here. You just okay. once a month. So that's small dollar amount. You're looking at that project. That's kind of how I'm balancing my workload with kind of risk management. I guess the other question I would have to follow up to you would be, why can't we just have an agreement that you have to bill at least on a quarterly basis, we but if you have well, I understand our agreement it says monthly. But it used to be. Why can't we go back to that and allow agencies to uh, build more if they want to, but quarterly is a minimum. Right. Well, that's what we had, and our inactive amount for local agencies was in the $20 million plus range. So that's why we had to go monthly to get people to bill us. But when we went quarterly, it was like, well, this quarter it is that we don't have enough and I'm too busy next quarter, I'll get it to it next quarter and that, that third quarter we're at nine months. So that's why, that's why we went, when inactive became Rick's highest priority, it then became my highest priority. So, well, not my highest, I tell Rick it's my highest. <laughs> He's in my office, so. That's right. So enough said on this. I I just want you to know it's being looked at all the time at the federal level. And when the inspector general's office looks at this and the auditors look at this, this makes no sense. When they look at it from a national perspective, they say we you know states, cities, counties are screaming for money, but look how much money they're sitting on and not spending. I hear what you're saying. This project's active. I just haven't gotten around the bill. I, I'm not arguing with you. I am beating this so hard because it has bit us again. And the end result is I'm going to have to, I'm going to be forced to start work projects. 
and you don't want that, and I don't want to do that. Yeah. Just just one other perspective. Uh, I don't know other people have the same uh, experience, but for, for me, I have a couple projects in, that are stuck in kind of environmental. As you saw in the earlier uh, description, where well, we thought we were going to be you know, six months, a year, for formal consultations, we're not being told two and a half years. And so I'm kind of stuck in limbo of, of well, how can I stay active waiting for NIMS to get me an answer? Over. So maybe that's something you could take back to folks with the pressure, <laughs> at least from my perspective. Uh, that's, that's our struggle of trying to keep current on, on actively building. And, and no, I'm glad you brought that up because so if I took that back to the people in D.C., they would say, what project is it? Why haven't you closed it out? If it's going to take them two years to get through this process, shut it down, move the money to another project. This is how this is viewed nationwide. There is no your and other states have somehow figured out how to how to manage this. So. What I would ask you is, you still have staff that are monitoring and managing this and most likely have eligible charges to bill, even if they're small. Why wouldn't you bill those, even if it's once every three months you do have eligible charges and it's a minimal amount because they're monitoring, they're, wor they're working with the services. Why wouldn't you submit that tiny bill and just so you know, if you don't, guess guess what I have to do? We're, we're going to. <laughs> that is the perfect but, answer. But, but everybody but, heard that, right? Everybody. But helps from different federal government agencies because it's going to take us two years to look at stuff. For other agencies forward in their review process, appropriate amount of time so that we don't have to worry about the project two and a half years before we move forward. And I and, and I recognize that. And uh, so if you're when you do have bills, I'm never asking anybody to submit a bill that isn't valid. But if it's tiny, and if you don't have bills for three months, you don't have bills for three months. But if you do have those small charges that have built up. Please do bill, um, even if they're a small amount, because I recognize that you do have staff that is out there monitoring the progress on some of these activities, and those are eligible charges. If that's all you can bill, then do it. Uh, so if the IG was sitting here, they would, they would come right at you on that. They'd say, no issues. That money should be on another project. And I think they'd look at the planning folks and say, why are you giving these projects this funding? So that would be their just default response. So anyways, thank you on that one. I, uh, I'm going to go to the next slide here. So uh, I'm going to do this. Good. So another one of my topics that you dislike the least, excuse me, you like the least, 10-year um, period of construction. This has come up, and some states have a real problem with it. Um, you have to proceed. I just want to reiterate that and that um, um, we are looking at this all the time. <clears throat> so closure of project, there's a lot of pressure for these projects that stay open. And uh, that ties into the last item, project end dates. I just want to reemphasize what was said before. Make sure you have enough time to uh, on your project end dates to ensure for all, all this final paperwork that seems to take a long time to get closed out. Because remember, what that end date is about is when local programs sends us the federal aid agreement to close out the final voucher in our system. So the extra time that was discussed is really important that you don't cut this too tight. Because once you pass that project end date, you cannot get reimbursed for those charges. Questions? Thank you very much.
All right. Well, I want to thank our state and federal partners. I think that was really great. I, I know Mark and I both uh, learned a lot. Um, in the remaining time, we asked the city of Kent, so Chad Beeren from the city of Kent and Mark DeAndre from the city of Tacoma, to share their lessons learned on a few of their projects. So um, I think, Chad, you'll go first, and Monica, if I can get you to switch out the slides, and then we'll queue Mark up. And then if there's time and others want to share some of their examples and questions and lessons learned, I think that'd be great. It's going to work. It's gonna We're work. on. Okay. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning. I'll go quickly because I'm sure everybody wants to get out of here. I'm Chad Beeren. I'm from the city of Kent. I'm the deputy public, public works director. I've been uh, with the city for about 20 years and uh, started working on uh, federally funded projects about 10 years ago. I was lucky enough for the first 10 years of my uh, career there to work on PIB and locally funded projects, which uh, by comparison, as everybody knows, is a piece of cake compared to uh, you know, federal funds. And uh, Kelly called me about a week and a half ago and said, hey, can you talk a little bit about project delivery with federal funds and some of the pitfalls? And we've had plenty of them. I hear nothing uh, that we haven't gone through when people ask questions around the room. Uh, we've done a little bit of everything. And as Stephanie can attest to, we've tried uh, many ways to uh, not get there. And we've tried many ways to get there. We've gotten a lot of help along the way. It occurred to me when I was trying to put this together, what is it like to deliver a federal project? And I happened to be uh, digesting Thanksgiving and uh, happened to uh, stay up really late and caught the Wizard of Oz the other night. So here's when uh, I said to Kelly, this could be, this could work or it could be an epic fail. So let's, let's give this a try. Uh, first things first, what's the expectation? We all start out with, uh, now it's not gonna show up. Boom. What's the expectation? We're gonna start out in Kansas, everything looks black and white. Uh, but uh, everybody thinks you're going to get the Emerald City and it's going to be very fast. You have a whole lot of uh, politicians, your leaders, uh, everybody who goes out and gets the federal money for you, depending on what level you're at, and says, hey, how quickly can we deliver this project? Then they come back and they tell you just how fast it's going to be and you feel like this gal. So what do they do? Move on, get a new project manager. <laughs> get started. You need to get there. What is the enemy of getting this thing done? Time. Yeah. Now, I've said it, everybody said it, you've heard it over and over again. I, I could say it a hundred times. If you do not keep track of your time and you lose uh, your focus on the critical path, you will fail on your project. You're trying to get there and you've got this uh, terrific team. There's a project manager. You have three things mainly you have to worry about. All these other restrictions and requirements we talked about with federal money. It doesn't matter if you've got federal money or if you're dealing all with state money, you have three main things to worry about. Utilities, right of way, and permits. If you can keep your eye on the prize with those three things, you will be successful. And I've found this to be true over and over again. Utilities can't move. You, you ask them to move, they cannot move. They'll tell you they'll move in a few months, it's not gonna happen. We've uh, tried everything to get them out of the way. Uh, what we've done more recently is essentially break projects up into phases and get the utilities out of the way first. Uh, on our 228th Union Pacific uh, Railroad Grade Separation Project, we actually had to move the BPA power lines. Uh, that takes about a year and a half of pre-planning. It's also, uh, was estimated to cost about a million, two million and a quarter. It costs $2.6 million by the time PSE was done. That's a cost that just gets passed right on through. So again, back to cost estimates, you know, how come you missed that? Well, we didn't miss it. PSE missed it, but we get to pay the bill. However, by doing this early, you'll see the, the uh, in the photo, lower right corner, that's 2017, two years ago uh, this month. We went through and got all the utilities out of the way. This makes sure that when we get the main project going, that you're not going to have uh, excessive change orders because once you get in with those utilities, they will find things underground they don't know exist which happened, but we got them all taken care of uh, before we got in there with uh, the remainder of our structural work, as opposed to having a project shut down for months. Now that doesn't, from FHWA, you're moving, it's not a, a project that's not uh, uh, moving along, a delayed project, but it is uh, a cost that's accumulating very quickly. So again, we also had a six foot uh, diameter storm pipe that had to get out of the way uh, that we owned. So we did that ahead of time. So again, utilities, if you can move them ahead of time, if you can't plan with them far in advance, right away. 
right away, property owners sometimes think that this is going to be their big payday, and they will be very uh, hard to work with. We have uh, a number of industrial owners. Someone said earlier, trusts, uh, that some of the big uh, retirement uh, groups own these uh, warehouses in Kent. They're hard to find. The local property owners, in general, no problem. You can get them to see just how they're helping get the project done. International guys, they don't care. Uh, we had one pro property. This this is hard to see from where you're sitting, but uh, the property in the back needed an easement uh, to 228th Street. Uh, we initially thought this would cost us several hundred thousand dollars, and in fact, it was about uh, uh, damages of five hundred eighty thousand dollars. It took us nine months to find the guy at corporate to accept our check. And in fact, uh, I had to I called the main office and asked the uh, administrative assistant. How can I get a hold of this guy? I'm trying to get him signed for a half million dollar check. He said, I'll call you when he comes in. Uh, it takes an amazing amount of focus to keep up on these things, an amazing amount of time. Uh, our right of way phase has been going for about four years. And uh, we are we're still not, we have possession use, we have our CERT 2, but we're still getting uh, our right of way completed. Lastly, and luckily on our project, permitting was not as big a deal. Uh, if you've got any kind of NIMS impact uh, or uh, Corps of Engineers said it, said it again, two years uh, at a minimum, two to three years now, uh, planning ahead. We did not have that issue. But again, uh, if you get your permits taken care of early or if you can do the design on your own, that's something we're changing in Kent now. We're trying to uh, fund the design on our own and get these things taken care of before we go ask for the federal money so that we're teed up and ready to go. Consultants, we'll tell you what you want to hear. Uh, don't believe that you can get this stuff done in months, This done in the same year. Uh, it's not going to happen that way, so you have to plan ahead for it. And then you get your contractor. Uh, who knows who you're dealing with? Uh, but the last thing uh, from lessons learned, uh, ask for help. And so uh, folks at PSRC and folks at Highways and Local Programs for us have been uh, absolutely terrific to work with. Uh, without their help, we wouldn't be making it. So we're going to open this project. This time next year, we'll have our grade separation done, which has been a project that's gone on for about, at that time, 15 years. Okay. So, very briefly. That was great. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Chad? And thank you that this was the image that you referenced, the SRC of Washington. All right. Thank you, Chad. Mm -hmm. You, you get to give your presentation with that in the background. <laughs> That's great, yes. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, I, w I don't have slides. I don't have any themes. Um, but uh, I was asked last night to step in for somebody who was sick. So I'm going to kind of do my best to work through this. My name is Mark DeAndre with the city of Tacoma. Oh, it looks good here. <laughs> so I was going to bring up the Taylor Way website just so you had a map, a visualization, and there it is. Good. Great. You don't have to use your phones. We're good. Um, okay. So I guess uh, in the in the email I saw talk about any issues, large or small, that can affect a project budget and a project schedule. Um, a little bit. I'll start with Taylor Way. Uh, Taylor Way is a $22 million heavy haul corridor that we're basically rebuilding. It runs from the Fife border to East 11th. This is a peninsula down in the Tide Flats. It's um, industrial land, generally pretty flat. And then as part of the project, we're also widening uh, the SR 509 intersection of Taylor Way, I'm adding some additional turn lanes. It's the number two freight bottleneck in the Olympic region. So um, that's kind of the big. Uh, emphasis of the project, all new illumination, uh, all concrete pavement, um, signals, uh, ITS, inter interconnection, fiber. Um, it's kind of a full right away reconstruction. Uh, we didn't have enough money for it. And then in, I think it was uh, August, uh, yeah, I think August or September 2017, I was sitting at my desk and I got this call from DOT and they said, if we give you $9 million, almost $10 million, can you uh, go to add by September of this year? And 
I wasn't going to say no. So we said yes. And then the National Highway Freight Program got uh, fully funded, uh, the, the freight plan approved in December of 17. So we had 18 months to kind of put this project together. Um, we knew we could do it. We knew we could do all the design. We could handle the permitting. We did have some wetland impacts and critical areas, uh, work to do, some mitigation. Um, but what I told them at the time is we have tribal US, U.S. trust properties along this corridor, and we're going to need an easement from one of them. I can't guarantee we're going to get through the right-of-way phase, but we'll try. And so I would say we did all our design. We are out to add. We did make our obligation date, so that's wonderful. Um, but the two big hiccups on this project was really right-of-way, and we were trying to do it in a shortened period, which was tough. And it really had a lot to do with um, the, as I spoke earlier, the uh, TCEs versus permits and how to get those TCEs and get all the legals drawn up and work with the property owners. And um, we went back and forth with DOT and they were providing guidance, which was helpful. Uh, but that was, that was a big issue and I would caution people to uh, think hard about that, think hard about what you really need out there um, and is it gonna hold up your project. So that was a big part of it. Um, the other big issue was BIA, right? So we have these BIA parcels. Um, we had issues about interpretation to CFRs, uh, DOT, our attorneys, our right-of-way section, um, and BIA all talking back and forth, and, and the Puyallup Tribe, because really the Puyallup Tribe can provide easement approvals with, for a short period of time, no more than seven years. Um, but we still had to get letters from BIA that said the tribe could do that, even though it's in the CFR. So there was a lot of kind of new ground being crossed in this project that we had to figure out. Um, and then, so we did do a full appraisal on the BIA parcel that we actually need about a 20-foot slice of. That went through. NEPA went through, no problem. Um, but then what we also found is that BIA does not accept federal NEPA anymore. Um, we used to just send them our federal federal NEPA documents, uh, you know, in all our binders and everything. And that was good. And we find out, no, they require a full EA now. So we didn't have that in our scope or budget. Uh, we had to address that all of a sudden. Thankfully, the, the BIA EA is not your standard EA. So um, it worked out to about 30 or 40 pages, kind of moving all our NEPA stuff around. And we had about a 300-page appendix. That was all the back of it. So that was thankfully approved. And, and so things that affect the project BIA, right? So we, submit, we submitted our first application to them in August of last year or something, and, um, or of this year, and they lost it. And we didn't know they lost it. And this is binders of information. They lost it. And then people changed positions. There was new management. Nobody knew about it. Nobody could find it. So here we're faxing, or not faxing, but scanning in our entire document because we still had a copy. We had to get it to them right away. Um, and then you don't hear back from them right away. You know, they have a number of months to even respond that they've received your application. So all this is going on and going on, and we're watching this date come closer and closer. Uh, we're still spending money, and we're told that there's no extensions on our funds. So... I would say just if you're working with BIA, factor that in. Um, thankfully, it it went through. The comment period just ended November 30th, and we received no comments. So uh, we should get our final letter here soon, and we can go from our CERT 3 to our CERT 1. Um, we did have some additional properties that we did not have our TCEs back. Again, that's what I spoke about earlier. There are these trust properties, um, family members not talking to each other. And uh, so we got a CERT 3 on some of those properties as well. It was all, you know, contained in the one letter. Um, that's all worked out. But I would say really focus on right-of-way. I would say if you have a very short timeline, focus on working as a team together with uh, DOT, local programs, the right-of-way department. Um, stay on top of that. Document things. Um, Leave it, yeah, I'll leave it there. So that is uh, kind of the Taylor Way project, where we are. Um, 
And if, well, that's a Taylor Way project. So other projects that I think really affect schedule and budget, um, Chris Story was gonna come and speak about a bridge project. He had a $40 million uh, bridge replacement over the Puyallup River. It was just a section of the Puyallup River Bridge or, or three sections of the, of the bridge. Um, a design build, it was in construction. Uh, the, had to get a crane to lift the bridge. There's only one crane in the country to lift the bridge. And it comes on about 37, 38 trucks. Got to be put together, working with BN and the railroads and UP, because they're both at this crossing or at, the, at this bridge location. Um, one of those trucks got stuck in the snow somewhere and didn't show up. And when you negotiate a bridge window with, or excuse me, a, a window with BN and UP, they say, this is it. If you miss it, sorry. Well, we missed it because of that truck that got stuck in the snow somewhere. Luckily, we were able to work with BN and UP and keep this monstrous crane on site and get another window time, but very stressful. And those are things that are kind of out of our control and, and that would drive up costs. Um, you know, everything's on standby at that point. But thankfully, it, it, it worked out. But those are kind of some of the big risks. And working with the railroad, too, I have a couple other projects working with the railroad. I have a Section 130 project, federal funds. Um, and we have other city projects that are non-federal funds. But I would say if you're working with BN especially, even though they have new management now and they're, I, re I really like working with them, they have no schedule. They have no incentive to get things done on your schedule. You can say, hey, I got this permit, it's going to expire in a year. I got all this money, it's going to, I, I, I can't get an extension on it, you know. And one of these projects was a crossing in Tacoma where we really just wanted to put up some fencing, kind of guide the public, and uh, some new pedestrian gates, uh, you know, the automatic pedestrian gates that come down. Not a whole lot of money, but it took over two years to do. And we had two fatalities at this crossing. So we were trying to get these in, a lot of public emphasis. We had council members calling. We had all kinds of things going on. Um, we had UTC kind of on our side that they provided some funding for us, um, but they are truly on their own schedule. And uh, explaining that to the public is very difficult, especially when there's fatalities in the mix. Another project I have is 6th Ave. It's down at Titlow. I don't know Titlow Beach, if anybody's familiar with Tacoma. Um, again, we're putting in some pedestrian gates and some sidewalk improvements and things like that. I submitted my schematic plans to them June 4th, and I still have not received an estimate back yet. So, and I've told um, the, the rail division at DOT that this was going to be a problem from day one, just based on our experience with BN. Um, Thankfully, we do have a state senator that lives right in that area, and he's very interested in the project, too, so hopefully that'll help. Um, and I can maybe ask him to move around if you have other issues on your projects and uh, vacant property or something. But uh, so, yeah, it's just there. I like them. And, you know, that dual fatality location, they told us over and over and over again, this is you are in our top three priority projects in the region or in their region, which is so many states in British Columbia, right? So two years to put up a fence and get gates in. I've, those projects that are not in their top priority and for the smaller municipalities, I think it's going to be really challenging. So I guess those are my stories. Uh, do you have any questions? I'd be happy to answer them. and. Not maybe we can go. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks to both Mark and uh, and Chad. I think hearing hearing real project examples from your peers is always valuable. I guess I'd open the floor to see if there are any other questions or if there's any other project examples that you all want to. Share with the group any anything that we haven't touched on that might be worth commenting on. I know it's getting very close to noon. Okay. 
Well, um, if there's nothing else, we'll, we'll be around for a little bit just cleaning up, but I want to thank everybody for coming. I think this was really valuable, and I really appreciate our, our state and federal partners for coming and sharing this information and our two project sponsors as well. I know we learned a lot. Um, we will we, – the webinar has been recorded. We're going to um, – compile all the questions and answers and, and try to post something, but feel free, those of you in our region anyway, feel free to send us any follow-up questions or comments and we'll try to, to do that and move forward. But thanks everybody and happy holidays.